Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm your host, Rahul Gosain, here with my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. Today, we're diving into the recent approval of telecitizumab, vidotin, telesov for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with CMET overexpression based off the luminosity trial. We're really excited to have Dr. Ross Kamich with us, a renowned thoracic medical oncologist from the University of Colorado and the lead author on this study. Ross, welcome. The tables have turned since the last time you had me on your podcast, and now today I get to ask the tough questions. Pleased to be here. Welcome, Ross. Let's just set the stage for our community colleagues. For metastatic, non-small cell lung cancer, landscape has gotten very crowded with targeted therapies approval and IO in past few years. NGS upfront to look for actionable mutation is extremely critical. And if no actionable mutations present, the choice is chemotherapy plus IO or IO alone. And then our option in second line are more chemotherapy or KRAS inhibitors or targeting HER2 mutation based on recent approval of TDXD. But now we should also be looking for CMET expression. Ross, before we talk more about the study itself, can you please start us off with the mechanism of action of TELUS-OV? TELUS-OV is an antibody drug conjugate. And obviously, these are licensed in multiple different tumor types already. You know, breast cancer has them, bladder cancer has them, but this is licensed in non-small cell lung cancer. It is a warhead called MMA, which is a microtubule-associated toxin, so it causes neuropathy, and it's directed against something called MET. Now, MET can be activated, as we know, through mutations, MET X14 skip mutations, MET amplification, but this is MET protein expression which actually is a wider net. It overlaps with some of those, but you should test it even if they have a driver oncogene. You know, you touched on this, Ross, antibody drug conjugates is something that we're seeing more and more, be it in breast cancer and now in lung cancer, and we've seen this in bladder cancer as well. Coming back to non-small cell lung cancer, Ross, how prevalent is CMET overexpression? And is it present from the get-go or is it more of a resistant mechanism? Can you touch a little on the testing of CMAT? Can we draw some parallels out in the community with HER2 testing? I see fish amplification, NGS mutation, we see that with HER2 as well. Out in the community as a medical oncologist or for our pathology colleagues, what should be on our radar? So MET protein expression exists at different levels. In this particular study, the breakthrough status and the accelerated approval was in what was called MET high. That represents about 12 to 13% of non squamous EGFR wild type non small cell lung cancer. In that setting, that's probably three to four times as common as ALK. It clearly is going to overlap with MET X114 skip mutants. They're kind of given that they're going to have it. It's going to overlap with primary MET amplification, but it will be present in ALKs and ROS1s and others. You touched on the fact that it can also be a mechanism of acquired resistance to targeted therapy in, you know, choose your favorite oncogene. In that setting, it will obviously increase by line of therapy. But for some people, it's present at the get go. So I would do the testing when the patient walks through the door. That's going to be positive in about 12 to 13 percent of people. In a proportion of those people, if they're negative and you're on a later line therapy, you could retest. There is a slight bump in the positivity rate but most of your money is going to go on getting it when they first walk through the door. So I'd be sending it off at the same time, be sending off PDL one testing. And while you got that test and it is positive in that 12 to 13 of the population, can it turn negative at a later time? So you have to retest it in a second line therapy? Usually no. Okay. It's something fundamental about it. There, as I said there, the positivity rate in this kind of real world study went from about 16% to about 19% in later lines of therapy. So not a big change over time, but it certainly didn't go down. Okay, so this is a great overview and background. Now let's jump into the luminosity trial that got this drug approved. Can you touch on the study design and some key endpoints? And then let's make sense out of how, where to use this. So this was a second or third line study. They had different cohorts. They had EGFR mutant, EGFR wild type. That was mostly in non-squamous and they had a separate squamous cohort. The squamous cohort, like many ADCs, was a bust. The EGFR mutant cohort was also a bust because it turns out that you need to keep the EGFR inhibitor going because it's a mechanism of acquired resistance. The focus is on non-squamous EGFR wild type. In about 2022, the CMET high group So the 12 to 30 percent had something like a 54 percent response rate. And that's what got it breakthrough status. 
The intermediate group, which is a slightly lower level of MET, which wasn't approved, had about a 25% response rate. Fast forward two or three years, the intermediate cohort stays the same. The MET high dropped down to about a 35% response rate, but that was enough to get it accelerated approval in May 2025. When looking at second line and beyond, outside of actual mutations, the choices docetaxel plus minus remucirumab, and the outcomes, as we all know, are poor. We definitely need to do better, and that's where telecitosumab bedotin is fitting in. And I know you just went recently about what is the response rate. When compared to the docetaxel remucirumab, though this is not a phase three data where there is no comparator arm, how are you comparing in terms of the choice of treatment here? Well, so the intermediate, so let, let's back up a little bit. So when you send off the testing, you can send it to Neogenomics, Caris, Tempus, Path Group Foundation, Medicine, LabCorp. It's the Ventana SP44 assay. A positive result is three plus in 50% or more of cells. That's met high. If it's 25 to 50%, that's intermediate. And technically that's not part of the approval. You can see from the response rate what was approved was the MET high with a 35% response rate. Now, in docetaxel, docetaxel ramacirumab, somewhere between a 10 and 23% response rate is expected. There is a confirmatory study called TELEMET, which is LISOV versus docetaxel predictably in those enriched for, for MET expression. And we'll see. But at the moment, because we're in the USA, we have accelerated approval. This drug actually works and in some people works really well. Ross, can I back up on the first line as well for a second? Given that our options are chemo, chemoimmunotherapy, or immunotherapy single agent, with someone with high CMET overexpression, is immunotherapy still an active agent here? Yeah, so remember, this is not all driver oncogenes. Some of these people are heavy smokers. Some of these people will have had a driver oncogene. You can get MET expression in KRAS. You can get MET expression in ALK. But I think the decision about immunotherapy in the first line is based on the driver oncogene status, not the MET IHC status. And then coming back to this can overlap, be it with KRAS G12C or even ALK, the indication here is not for EGFR mutations, but what if there is that overlap KRAS or ALK mutations here? Then it's an additional second or third line option. If you were a G12C, you probably have chemoimmunotherapy, then a G12C inhibitor, then maybe this, you could use it in the third line. If you're ALK, it gets a wee bit more complex because some of that's acquired resistance. And what you really scientifically want to do is combine it with the TKI, but that's not part of the approval. And on the same topic, is there any commutational aspect with HER2 at all? I don't know that I've ever had one which is both HER2 and MET at the same time. I imagine it's tossing a coin. All right. Coming back to Telesov, anytime there's a new approval, toxicity is something that should be on our radar. Can you touch on some of the key side effects and clinical pearls in managing side effects that come along with Telesov? So any ADC which has an MMAE warhead, which is going to go off to microtubules, will generate peripheral neuropathy. And the rate of sort of any grade peripheral neuropathy is about 30-40%. If you look at the discontinuation rate for peripheral neuropathy, it happens in about 20% of people, but the average time is like 240 days. So it's actually a surrogate for efficacy. You're on it long enough to get it. For me, what you do is with the patients is you keep asking about that neuropathy and you don't let it get to grade three. You're grade one, grade two, you're having treatment breaks. I mean, you've managed this with non-ADCs with peripheral neuropathy. You just have to try and keep your patient's fingers functional. Right. And that's an important toxicity aspect because it affects the quality of life significantly. We've seen that with oxaliplatin certainly comes much faster there as opposed to Telisov. And we are seeing some of this with enfortimab bedotin as well. Ross, with regards to managing this neuropathy, we have the option, of course, gabapentin, pregabalin, any clinical pearls around other modalities like cryotherapy. I have no experience with that. The biggest thing for me is it can snowball from grade two to grade three relatively quickly. It's almost like pneumonitis. So you've got to pick it up when it's grade one and start to play around with things in terms of dosing and scheduling rather than let the snowball roll down the hill. And in such situations when you're seeing these patients, do you usually go with decreased dose, skip a dose itself and restart at a lower dose? Or how do you maneuver through that? So I do, I do I mean, the nice thing is now this license, we have much more freedom than in the trial. I would probably skip doses and dose reduce in that order. 
before we close, do we need to check for CMET in squamous cell histology, or this is only relevant to adenocarcinoma? Only in non-squamous histology, because that's the indication. And also, squamous lung cancer has been a bit of a graveyard for ADCs so far. Well, Ross, congratulations to you and our patients on this new approval. We eagerly look forward to phase three conformatory data on this. But for now, telocytosumab vidotin is yet another treatment option for our non-small cell lung cancer after disease has progressed on chemo IO upfront. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In today's discussion with Dr. Ross Kemmage, a medical thoracic oncologist and the lead author of Luminosity Trial, we had a chance to touch on the recent approval of telocytosumab vidotin in non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer with high CMET overexpression. CMET overexpression is defined as about 50% and above on IHC and can be seen in about 15 to 17% non-small cell lung cancer adenocarcinoma histology. Testing for this is important, especially now as given data supporting higher response rate in this patient population with telocytosumab. Just like with any new drug, even here, we have to keep side effects in mind. And with telocytosumab, neuropathy, fatigue, and cytopenia should be on our radar. Though this is now going to be part of our treatment option, we eagerly await on the data for bigger confirmatory trials to ensure this is indeed the right approach. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to check out our other conference highlights, treatment algorithms, and talk check discussions. We are the Oncology Brothers.